Hey everyone, my name is Daniel Grozowski and I'm a junior doctor in the NHS and a member of Radkist Academy. Today I'd like to talk to you about ankle fractures. This talk should give you an idea about the most common presentations of an ankle injury and make you more comfortable about patients with these injuries. Whether you're a junior doctor in a &E, trauma and orthopedics or an allied health professional, you can expect to encounter them commonly and might be expected to be familiar with the basic principles of anatomy and pathology of the ankle joint. During the presentation, we will cover a normal ankle joint anatomy, some typical injuries in the presentations, we will talk about Ottawa ankle rules for determining which patients require imaging, and have a look at some normal x-rays and the most common projections. Following that, we will talk about the Weber classification and common fracture patterns, including intra and extra articular fractures. To conclude, we'll have a look at some post-treatment x-rays. To start off, we should have a look how a normal ankle anatomy looks like. An ankle joint is made up of three bones, the distal end of tibia, the distal end of fibula, and talus. The joint line extends from the medial malleolus of tibia to the lateral malleolus of the fibula. Pay attention to the joint space between the tibia and fibula and the talus. As you can see from the diagram, the joint space is uniform across the whole ankle joint and you can trace it nicely from the medial malleolus to the lateral malleolus. The ankle joint is supported by a lot of different ligaments and soft tissue structures. Some of the most important ones are shown in the slide. The most common injury ones are the anterior talofibular ligament and the calcaneofibular ligament. Those will be most commonly injured in what we commonly call an ankle sprain. You can see the anterior talofibular ligament extending anteriorly from the lateral malleolus and the calcaneofibular ligament also originating from the lateral malleolus and traveling towards the lateral side of the calcaneus. As said before, those are the most common um, ligamentous injury of the ankle. So a typical history of a patient you can see, for example, in a &E with an ankle injury would be an inversion of the ankle. This would lead to an inability to weight bear swelling of the ankle and tenderness of the medial or lateral malleolus. There can also be a reduced range of movement of the joint on examination. This leads us to Ottawa ankle rules, which are a clinical tool to establish which patients with an ankle injury require an x-ray. It's a very useful set of rules and there is no reason these shouldn't be documented for every patient with an ankle injury and supply those clinical details on an x-ray form. The Ottawa ankle rules state that a patient with a traumatic ankle pain qualifies for imaging if one of the following is present. Inability to wait bare four steps immediately after the injury and in the emergency department. Tenderness over the medial or lateral malleoli, Or tenderness at the posterior edge along the distal six centimeters of the tibia or fibula. When correctly applied, Ottawa ankle rules have a 97.5% sensitivity, are well validated and widely regarded as a useful clinical tool that should be used in clinical practice. So if we've decided to perform an X-ray of the ankle joint based on the Ottawa ankle rules we've just discussed, uh, this will usually involve taking slightly different views to a regular um, AP and lateral joint views. The most common and useful view is called the mortar view. This is taken with a 15 to a 25 degree end of rotation of the foot compared to a simple anterior postural uh, projection. This makes for the best visualization of the joint and reduces overlapping of the relevant bones. On a true AP view, the talus overlaps a portion of the lateral malleolus, obscuring the lateral aspect of the joint, making the joint more difficult to assess. So to illustrate that, on this slide, we've got a normal AP view on the left with a mortis view on the right. As you can see, on a normal AP view, the lateral portion of the joint is obscured with the fibula overlapping and the tibia, and the joint space is more difficult to assess. On the contrary, when looking at a mortis view, we can easily trace the joint line from the lateral to the medius malleolus, and there is minimal overlapping of the bones, and this makes it a much clearer view uh, to assess for uh, the joint space and any relevant injuries. Coupled with a mortis view, it is usually a good idea to also perform a lateral view, as you would perform for most other injuries. This is because we are viewing a 3D structure in 2D radiographs, and some injuries might be better visible in different planes. The x-ray here shows a normal lateral ankle x-ray. You can see the tibia anteriorly, 
and normal shaped talus and a fibula shadow posteriorly overlying the shadow of the tibia. As we've talked before, ankle joints are supported by a lot of different ligaments and soft tissue structures. Those obviously can be seen on an x-ray, but they have a vital role in ensuring joint stability and therefore are important to remember. If the ligaments are ruptured, this can contribute to the instability of the ankle and allow joint dislocations. Rough ligament locations are shown on these helpful x-rays and the overlying um, colorful structures. This is important as if there is a fractured line extending through the ligament insertion sites, we can expect those ligaments to also be disrupted. So this is your normal anatomy of the ankle joint and some normal ankle x-rays we've just seen. Let's move on to the ankle joint pathology and some common injury patterns. The easiest way to approach common pathologies of the ankle joint is to look at the Weber classification first. The Weber classification divides fractures into those below syndesmosis, which are called Weber A fractures, at the level of syndesmosis, Weber B fractures, and above the level of syndesmosis, which are Weber C fractures. It provides an easy way of categorizing ankle fractures and has implications when it comes to assessing joint stability. We need to talk about joint stability because it has major implications to patient management. If the joint is stable, then the bones stay in an anatomical position, which gives the best chance of union and joint healing. If the joint is unstable, however, then the relevant bones have the ability to misalign relative to the normal positions, which impairs joint healing. The ankle joint stability is maintained by the combination of bones and ligaments. If the structure is broken only in one place, and there is no dislocation, then the joint is stable. However, if there is an injury in more than one place, which can include both bones and ligaments, then the joint is unstable. Of course, as said before, ligaments cannot be seen on an x-ray. However, the usual positions are known, so judging by the side of bone injury, we can implicate where the ligament has also been affected, or the caution is still needed. The Weber classification itself can give us a clue about ankle joint stability. As said before, Weber A fractures are a fracture below the level of syndesmosis. Usually, they are a transverse fracture of the lateral malleolus and are stable injuries. In rare occasions, medial malleolus is also fractured and those are unstable injuries. When it comes to Weber B fractures, those are fractures at the level of tibial fibula syndesmosis. They have a variable stability depending on the underlying bony and soft tissue injury. Therefore, it's advisable to seek a senior opinion about these before deciding on further management. Moving on to Weber C fractures, uh, those are fracture above the level of syndesmosis. In those fractures, the syndesmosis is disrupted, and we often see a medial malleolus fracture together. They are usually unstable injuries and require an open reduction tonal fixation, so those patients are usually admitted for surgical management under trauma orthopedics. There is a special consideration needed for Weber C fractures, however. As we know, they are injuries of birth, so proximally to the level of syndesmosis. However, this can be as high as the level of proximal fibula, and this wouldn't usually be seen on a regular ankle x-ray, on your regular mortis and lateral views. Hence, if there is a high suspicion of this injury, an x-ray proximally should also be taken, such as a knee x-ray, to assess the proximal fibula for an injury. Here we've got some x-rays of the different fracture patterns we've discussed. The x-ray on the left shows a classical Weber A fracture with a transverse fracture on the lateral malleolus. There are no other obvious injuries seen on this x-ray and the medial malleolus is intact, making it potentially a stable injury. The middle x-ray is a classical x-ray of a Weber B fracture, which extends through the syndesmosis between tibia and fibula. We can see that the joint space is relatively preserved throughout the joint. So potentially this could be a stable injury. However, again, caution is advised. The last x-ray on the right shows a Weber C fracture, which is proximal to the tibial fibula syndesmosis. Those are usually unstable. Now let's have a look at some sample ankle fracture x-rays bearing in mind what we've discussed so far. Here we've got a first x-ray of a patient with an ankle injury. Can you see the abnormality here? 
This x-ray shows a web A transverse fracture through the lateral malleolus. Of note, we can also appreciate a significant degree of soft tissue swelling over the lateral malleolus. And this one, we've obviously got two different injuries here, two different x-rays. The left x-ray shows a Weber A fracture again. So the same type of fracture as we've just seen, a transverse lateral modulus fracture below the level of syndesmosis. The second x-ray is more interesting though. This is a Weber B fracture with a significant degree of dislocation. We can see how the joint space is widened on the medial and lateral sides representing a fracture dislocation. This would be an injury that needed discussing with uncle orthopedics for an operative management, as it requires metal work to ensure joint stability. And how about this one? Can you see the injury here and can you name it? Now this is a Weber C fracture. We can see a fracture of the fibula just proximally to the tibia fibula syndesmosis. One can also note widening of the joint space in the medial aspect. Therefore, this is an unstable injury and needs to be considered for operative management. How about this x-ray? This is a more difficult one. Clearly, we can see that the joint space is distorted. There's a clear medial shift of the tibia, giving us a widening of the ankle joint space. However, we can't see an obvious fracture, at least not on this x-ray. Remember when we've discussed Weber C fractures that can extend quite far proximally. Let's have a look at a more proximal x-ray of the same patient. Now on this x-ray, we can see a lateral proximal view of the tibia and fibula of the same patient uh, that had a mortis view on the previous x-ray. We can now clearly see that there is a fracture of the proximal fibula. This is a special type of Weber C fracture called a Meissner fracture. As we can see, it's quite easy to miss those, and we must remember to look out for the proximal fibular fracture when assessing patients with an ankle injury. I'd also like to add a quick note about intraverse extraarticular fractures. Intraarticular fractures involve disruption of the cartilage of the joint and are fractures through the joint line. Breaking of the cartilage carries a bad prognosis and can contribute to early osteoarthritis. Those fractures also usually require operative fixation to ensure best possible alignment of cartilage fragment as to reduce the risk of early osteoarthritis. Here we've got an example of an intraarticular fracture. As you can see, there is a fracture of both medial and lateral malleoli extending into the joint line. It is quite highly likely that the cartilage would have been disrupted giving a bad prognosis for this type of injury. It is therefore vital that we seek an expert trauma orthopedics opinion because this fracture might need fixation in theatre. To conclude, as we've talked about ankle joint stability and fixation, I'd like to show you some post-treatment x-rays. Bear in mind how the initial fracture is usually clean and stable and the surgery aims to restore the stability and equal joint space throughout the whole joint. The first x-ray shows a Weber B fracture dislocation on the left and a post-treatment x-ray on the right. The joint space anatomy has been restored, which we can see it was clearly disrupted on the left with the uh, tibia displacing medially. And the fracture has been stabilized on the right x-ray by some plates and screws and the joint line has been nicely restored. Another example of a Weber B unstable fracture, as shown here on the x-ray on the left, there's quite a lot of um, soft tissue swelling around the lateral malleolus. This time, the medial malleolus is also fractured. Again, as we can see, post-treatment of the fracture, the joint line is nicely restored and we can trace the same amount of joint space around the whole joint from the medial to the lateral malleolus. This concludes my talk and thank you for listening. Here are some resources I have used during the presentation. I hope you have found the presentation useful and I hope it gives you some clarity on ankle fractures. Please get in contact with Ratcast if you've got any further questions. I would like more topics covered. 
Thank you for listening to this talk. Goodbye.